Hello, everyone, and good afternoon or evening or morning, depending on your location and time zone. So um, I want to talk a little bit about fat burning and weight loss, because I think it's interesting. And this is kind of thing, something that plagues us all. Everybody has, well, almost everybody has unwanted body fat. And um, if somebody could do me a favor, and I'm pretty sure my sound is working, but if you just raise your hand to make sure that my sound is functional, I will know. There we go. Thank you, Betty. All right, so let's do it. I am going to uh, close the camera down so you can see the screen better. Well, first of all, this, let me just chat for a second. So um, tell you what's happening. So right now, that's a good question. What is happening? So I just turned 55 a few days ago and um, had a really good birthday. Uh, I'm taking off for a vacation uh, day after tomorrow. So I'm going to have a little break. We are in the midst now at the Chaos Institute of doing a bunch of exciting things. Um, I have a couple of conferences I'll be teaching at. So in September, I'll be at the IFM conference in Seattle teaching. I'll be at the CASI conference in Nashville teaching, which is a great opportunity. If you're a healthcare practitioner, um, IFM events and CASI events are kind of must go to's. And then in October, I'll be in Ireland. Um, at a conference put on by Maeve Craven. If you're in Ireland, you should come visit us. We're going to have a really good time. We've got some great doctors doing talks there. And then we're going to wrap up the season at the end of October. We'll be in Scottsdale again at the IFM conferences. So we're talking a lot about GI and the microbiome this year and um, some practice building things. And um, for these kind of uh, talks like today, I'm much more interested in looking at some of the labs that, uh, that I've been studying for a while. So a little bit of background, you know, for those of you that are relatively new to this, uh, I don't know, about 35, 40 years ago. So where does that place us? In the 1970s, late, er, maybe early 1980s, um, as functional medicine was just starting to be created by the original founders, mostly naturopaths, some chiropractors, a few MDs, you know, there's a real strong interest in laboratory testing. And the the frustration at the time was that conventional medical labs were great and did what they needed to do to find pathology and disease processes but you know how were we going to advance the field of functional medicine for forward you know looking for functional problems for problems prior to the onset of a disease and and that was sort of the conundrum of uh, the group of people that were my original teachers so i came on the scene in 1992 and functional medicine had already been pretty well established, you know, in the last 5, 10, 15 years. There certainly were lab companies that were running, that were doing the testing, but it was still pretty early days. I didn't realize it at the time, but um, you know, looking back now. And so around just before the period where I got involved, there were a couple of doctors that were very impactful for the whole profession, really. So there's Dr. Bill Timmons, who was focusing on adrenal hormone testing and adrenal programs and female hormone programs with a lab called Diagnostics. And there was a, a man named Dr. Richard Lord who was creating another lab company called Metametrics along with his partner, Andy Brawley. And so these two labs and amongst others, you know, the many others, you know, were, were sort of growing and prospering in this era. And for what we're gonna talk about tonight, you know, much more in the lineage of Dr. Lord uh, and Braley, they were looking at amino acids, organic acids, fatty acids. We're going to look at this. You know, trying to figure out how can you measure human physiology? How can you measure human biochemistry in action? You know, and, and if you study conventional medical tests, they're looking for pathology, right? That's a whole different purpose. They're looking for a cancer. They're looking for a heart attack. They're looking for someone who, you know, is at risk for having a stroke because they have high blood pressure. So they're doing testing, whether it's laboratory testing, physical exams, all the kinds of things that are done, MRIs, CAT scans, all that. They're, you know, 100% focused on finding life-threatening problems. And again, this era of practitioners and PhDs and researchers in the integrative and functional medicine community in the 70s and 80s were really focused on an entirely different question, which was how can we figure out where the physiology and the biochemistry breaks down before the onset of a disease process? And so if you're kind of a science geek like I am, and, and like I was even in, in those years, 
you get really interested in studying the physiology of this, and then you look at the labs that we do in functional medicine, you realize, my gosh, you're like displaying this person's biochemistry on a lab, not looking for diseases, you're not looking for, like for example, with a liver test that a conventional doctor would do, they're looking for liver enzymes in the bloodstream, right? And that means the liver cells are dying. And that's a pretty advanced level of liver disease, right? It's the beginning of liver disease where you're having a pathology or there's something that seriously wrong with your liver. What uh, people like Dr. Lord and Dr. Timmons were looking for was like, what happens to the liver in that very first stage where it's not working well, long before cells are dying, what happens when the cells are just being injured? And that's what we're going to talk about tonight is how can you figure out when your liver cells are getting injured? How can you figure out when your fat burning mechanism that is you know, happening in the liver is not working well. And then how can you start to repair that? So this is not about you know, people who have you know, advanced diseases like hepatitis and things that really damage your liver. We're talking about people that just wanna lose weight and can't lose weight because the liver's messed up and the liver's not burning fat very well. And it turns out that the more and more that you look at these tests, and you know, I've been doing this since 1992, and, um, which is a long time, and, and you know, even just like today and yesterday, I probably spent, you know, eight, ten hours reviewing labs and talking with doctors about labs. Forget about my patient practice. I still have a very active patient practice. If you're interested in working for with me, you know, I, I work exclusively over the phone. Sign up, become a new patient. It'd be great to run the labs on you. But you know, the majority of my time is spent now uh, training training doctors and working with researchers and trying to figure out, you know, deeper levels of the of the stuff like we're looking at tonight. And so it's this endless process of study and it's just really, it's just fascinating. So uh, tonight I wanted to talk specifically then about a really great diet because it's easy to get your hands on this. Um, the woman's name is Anne Louise Gittleman. She's been around forever. Um, the original book I would recommend called The Fat Flush Plan. She's got a newer book out, but the newer book has kind of been watered down a little bit. And in the newer book, she allows a lot more leeway with the diet. So I, I like her original book, the very first edition. You can buy it from Amazon. Probably costs five or ten bucks to get the older book. Maybe you get a used copy of it, whatever. But that original, original book, um, the diet in it, it's really easy to follow. I mean, it's almost kind of fun. You drink, you know, your cranberry cocktail drink in the morning and you get your flax oil and, you know, you kind of have to gear up for it a little bit. But every single bite of food and every drink of liquid that she has you do is primarily designed to repair the liver. So I really endorse the diet because it's easy to get a hold of the book. It's easy to follow the diet. The recipes are great. The food tastes good. You don't ever feel like you're hungry all the time. She's got you eating plenty of healthy fat, plenty of protein, obviously tons of vegetables and fruit. And, you know, it's just an all, you can even have whey protein. You want to do a, you know, like a smoothie like I do every day. You can dump a bunch of whey protein in there. And whey protein is wonderful because it helps increase your glutathione levels, which is one of the major antioxidants. It helps protect your liver. So anyways, it's a great diet. I totally endorse it. I did it. Um, twice this last year and it worked great for me in terms of feeling good and and um, and dropping some weight and getting my liver to be in better shape. So I want to talk today a little bit about the science behind all the liver related stuff, show you some labs. And then if you're interested, go out and buy the book and do her diet. I didn't just do it for two or three weeks. You don't have to do it the rest of your life. Um, and it's very well described in the book. I'm honestly not going to review the book here. You can just pick up a copy of the book. Uh, again, it's Anne Louise Gittemann Fat Flush Plan. Uh, there's me. I am now, believe it or not, lead faculty at the Institute for Functional Medicine's Practice Implementation Program. I go to all their conferences and I teach doctors how to implement practices. I did actually do a research study with the Mayo Clinic. It's hard to believe that I pulled that one off. And I now work with my hero. So, you know, 15, 20 years ago, my hero was Dr. Lord. And, you know, you would call into the Metametrics Lab back in those days and be, you know, honored if you got him on the phone for a minute or two. Now I spend hours every Monday working with Richard Lord, and it's been one of the greatest uh, experiences of my career, I think, to first of all, have such a, a, a wonderful, spiritually oriented man in my life. He's older, he's in his late 70s now, you know, and um, I just really uh, respect him as a human being. And he's a Southern Baptist, he's very religious, and he's very pure in his thinking, and, you know, very spiritually oriented man, fundamentally. 
and he happens to be a brilliant scientist who developed you know at least 50 percent or more of the testing that's done in functional medicine you know to this day so anyways he's he's been a uh, an incredible teacher and a lot of the work that I do now is really just passing on what what Dr. Lord teaches me. Um, and I got certified. I'm IFM certified. Like I'm legit now, um, which is kind of cool too. I passed the certification test. Back when I was learning how to do this, they didn't have IFM certification. And so I had to go back to school and redo all my IFM stuff recently to get certified. So I want to talk about how to follow a diet you know again read the book it's all described really well get the original fat flush book not the newer one and um, i want to show you how you can what's really happening kind of behind the scenes in terms of the physiology of resetting your metabolism and cleaning out your liver and if your liver's in you know if you just do the diet and louise gittleman's diet for two weeks four weeks six weeks your liver will be in that much better shape and that much more effective at burning fat going forward right it's not just a temporary kind of thing um, this is the new book. Don't buy that one, okay? <laughs> buy the old one. Um, buy the original one, all right? And um, we'll talk a little bit about the physiology behind all this and, you know, how this all works in functional medicine. And so one of the major problems, if not the major problem, facing humanity today, besides the fact that we're in a global political crisis and, um, you know, all that kind of stuff, and uh, besides the fact that there's climate change and, we may not be able to survive on this planet for a whole lot longer. Besides those kinds of things, you know, on the human level, what I think is one of the urgent, probably the most urgent issues is environmental toxins affecting the human body. And your liver is doing most of the job to, to deal with environmental toxin exposure. So when we look at the underlying cause column on the left-hand side of this diagram, you know, what we're really focusing on uh, for tonight is toxins, heavy metals and chemicals, environmental toxins. Um, it could also be other things that you're dumping in your body, like caffeine, uh, like alcohol. Uh, it could be over-the-counter drugs, uh, like you know, painkillers and and all that kind of stuff. You know, antidepressant medications, whatever that you're taking into your body that you're forcing your liver to metabolize or break down. And in general, you know, pretty much all of us have this toxic burden, which is really quite astronomical, and it has a, a very real effect on the liver. And one of the effects of toxins on the body. Uh, probably not the most important effect, but certainly an unsightly effect, is that your your liver can't burn fat if it's spending all its time burning toxins. That's the bottom line. I learned this initially years ago. One of my patients was a firefighter, and he was a captain. You know, he kind of risen up through the ranks throughout a 30-year career. And he had, as he went to the desk job and was no longer rushing into burning buildings had put on a lot of weight and he and his wife came in as patients and he wanted to go on a really significant weight loss program he wanted to drop like 50 pounds and it was very interesting because one of the things that i learned you know, working with him and his wife was that the at the time the california firefighters association magazine you know they had like a monthly magazine that came out they actually had articles in the magazine about the risk of firefighters lo losing large amounts of weight because firefighters spend the earlier parts of their career running into burning buildings and saving people and saving property and that turns out to be a very high risk job for chemical exposure and these chemical toxins are stored in a large part in our fat tissue and if you gain weight as you get older as a firefighter and you have a huge chemical and toxin burden then you all of a sudden burn that fat off it can make you really sick and that was really quite something to see you know a state uh, uh, you know firefighters association being aware of environmental toxin exposure because you know if you're the captain firefighter guy now of the whole department or whatever and you drop 50 pounds you could get you know seriously ill from all those toxins being released from your fat tissue. So that was sort of my initial wake up call to, to understanding this very strong relationship between toxins and the liver and between the liver and body fat. And that's what we want to look at. And then, you know, in terms of what your goals are, we're not going to get too much into that, but, you know, usually what we're talking about getting more energy, losing weight. And I always want to think about body systems. So we're going to talk exclusively about the liver tonight, but you know, it's in the context of, of making sure that we think of these other systems and that when we're doing treatments like detoxification treatments, they always come last, right? So we start with neuroendocrine 
balancing the adrenals, the thyroid, the sex hormones, the neurotransmitters, the mitochondria. We get that neuroendocrine system working well so the person's feeling better. Get through all the microbiome, fix everything to do with your gut, get that working properly. That usually takes quite a bit of time. And then once your body's pretty healthy and all those systems are working, then we look at detoxification. Now, however, there's an exception to this, which is that you can certainly do the fat flush diet at any stage of the healing process without getting into trouble. So I thought it's kind of a good way to uh, reach out and talk to people about a healthy way that you can start the detox process simply by eating in a way that's going to repair your liver, even though when we get into more advanced detox programs, usually they come at the end of of all this um, you know treatment. And so there's a bunch of different tests we can look at now for a moment, organic acids testing. Um, you can also test for toxins. I'm starting to do some of these labs in my practice now. For heavy metals, obviously, you can test for chemicals that are in the body tissues as well, as depressing as that may be. And what we're talking about is a total body burden. You know, how much have you been exposed to throughout your life and what's really going on with that? So let me show you here. I want to uh, show you some other examples of information about how the detox systems work. And there's... Uh, hopefully this diagram will pop up on your screen and we can take a look at this. So I think this is really interesting and some just basic physiology that we should all know, you know, probably should have learned this in high school or something like that. So you just have a basic understanding of math, geography, and a little bit about how your body works, especially in regards to how we all need to, you know, try to figure out how to cope with the modern world here and all the environmental toxins. So let me see if I can make this a little bit bigger for you all. I think, hang on a second, sorry. There we go. This should be better. There we go. So we can make fat internally and we can eat foods that have fat. And what this diagram is trying to show you is the dynamic movement of all of this. And so if we zoom in a little bit here, I think you can see. Uh, let's see if my computer is going to cooperate. Yeah, there we go. Look at that. Look at that. Here's how your this whole system works. So remember, we're talking about where does the fat get burned up in your liver? What would prevent the fat from getting burned up if your liver is working overtime trying to do other things like get rid of environmental toxins? So here's an example of food coming in. You can see the small intestine, right? And that food comes in. Eventually, we get these fatty acids that are being produced. And interestingly enough, um, we can also make fat from carbohydrate, right? From glucose or fructose. You can see that happening here. Eventually, all these different sources of calories go into the liver. Here's a hepatocyte, that means liver cell. And then your body decides to start to figure out what to do with it. Is it going to burn it up for energy or is it going to start to make fat out of the food that you ate? And here you can see under fasting circumstances, when there's not a lot of fat coming in from what you're eating, your body makes fat in the liver cells and then it releases it into the bloodstream. And it's pretty cool. Your body can also, over here, you'll see, burn that fat up for fuel, for energy, which obviously we want to do as well. So it's a complex interaction. There's food coming in in the form of fat or carbohydrate. All this stuff is going to your liver. Your body is then making fat, fresh fat, you know, in the liver itself and then releasing it into the bloodstream. So if you look at some of these tests we're gonna look at in a moment, and you're looking at fatty acid levels or fat levels in the bloodstream, it's a combination of fats that we're making and fats that we're eating kind of mushed together. But by far the most important determinant of fat and what's happening with fat is the fat that you're making, which is relying upon a healthy liver, right? It is also obviously, and everyone knows this already, very easy to eat too much fat. I don't think we need to dwell on that for a long time, right? That's kind of a no-brainer. So I'm not saying that that's not a problem. I'm just saying that I'm trying to talk about other stuff tonight that it's a little more uh, 
you know you might not be aware of okay and this whole thing is pretty interesting let me show you uh i have a blow up of this too let me give you the blow up version now uh here uh bingo there it is all right so on this version of it you'll see hang on a sec let me find the slide Uh, it's going to come up somewhere in here. There it is. Okay. Now, on this blow, it's kind of like a detailed version of what we were just looking at, right? So here you have your fatty acid, and your body takes that fat, and it can do a couple things with it. It can pull it down here into the mitochondria, where it burns it up for energy, that's a good thing. You want to burn fat for fuel. It's a very good source of energy. If you can't pull that fat into the mitochondria for whatever reason, then that fat's going to go over to these other structures here called peroxisomes. And the peroxisomes then are going to be dealing with the fat. And they can actually oxidize and break down fat. They're just not very good at it. It's like a backup system. That's not that great. I don't know. It's like if you're you know, your electricity went out and you have a generator and you kick the generator on. Okay, it's not as great a way to make energy for your house as having the real electrical stuff working, right? But it gets you by. So think of peroxisomes like that. So peroxisomes, if they start to get kicked into gear, will make this stuff called adipate and suberate. And keep that in the back of your mind because that's going to be important in a minute. So again, if your primary mechanism of burning fat in the liver is not working great, your backup system of peroxisomes, like the backup generator of peroxisomes, is going to start to burn the fat, but it's not that good at it. It's messy, you know, it's not efficient. And this, the, the byproduct, what's spit off of there, is the adipate and suberate that we can measure on these tests. And the mechanism, and again, let's get in a little more detail here, that actually does this, it's called the carnitine shuttle. And you can see here, Again, we're in a liver cell. You just imagine you're deep down in one of your liver cells. And you're going to take a lipoprotein. That's how fat circulates in your body. Lipo or lipid, that means fat, right? It's a lipoprotein, so it's kind of a fat crammed into a protein. Um, we know the term uh, lipoprotein, LDL, HDL, you know, we're pretty familiar with that, usually um, commonly ter used terms. So that fat then, in a perfect world, is going to get shuttled by carnitine into the mitochondria, which is a structure that makes energy, and then out of that energy comes ATP. I mean, out of that fat comes ATP, and then as some you know, accessory or waste products, we want to call them carbon dioxide and water. Pretty handy. And in order for this whole process to happen inside the mitochondria, you have to have three things. First of all, you have to have the carnitine get the fat over there, remember? And if that's not happening, what happens? The, car the carnitine is not working. That shuttle's not there. It's like you're waiting at the bus stop and the bus never shows up. Okay, you have to figure out a different plan. The alternate plan is that the peroxisomes are going to burn the fat. And you can track that by measuring adipate and suberate. If adipate and suberate go up, that's bad, right? That means your backup system is engaged. And then if it's all working properly and the carnitine grabs that fat and pushes it into your mitochondria, you need three things for the mitochondria to convert that fat into energy. Three things. Well, you need a lot more than three, but this is you know, three primary things. If we talked about all the things that you needed, it would take like probably like days. But we can talk about the three primary things you need to make energy, okay? The three primary things that you need to make energy from your food, magnesium, something called CoQ10, and you need oxygen, large amounts of oxygen. So oxygen, fortunately, you don't have to buy, at least not yet in human history, right? Oxygen is just you breathing. Magnesium, you should be getting from your food, but how many of us eat green leafy vegetables with every meal? Not all of us, right? So magnesium is a common nutritional deficiency. And then uh, CoQ10 should be coming from healthy food as well, but we find oftentimes people are low on CoQ10. So here's a blow up of what's happening inside the mitochondria now. We keep going deeper into the liver, okay? And you take fat, carbohydrate, and protein, and you burn it up for energy in the citric acid cycle. And in order to do that, 
you need to have a fair amount of magnesium, CoQ10, and oxygen. So breathing exercises help a lot. Green leafy vegetables with magnesium or magnesium supplements help a lot. And then if you need it and you're low in it, CoQ10 can make a big difference as well. Now, the other thing that's on this diagram here, and we should try to do a blow up of it, is I talked a lot about carnitine and how it's a shuttle. Carnitine grabs fat, remember? Grabs fat and it pulls it down into where you can make energy. And if that's not working properly, you don't have enough carnitine, adipate, superate, and ethylmalinate go up. And carnitine, like carnivorous, carnitine is from red meat. Vegan or vegetarians can be low in carnitine, not always, but it can happen. And vegans or vegetarians can be low in B12, which is important for this whole process too. Pretty simple solution. You want to be vegan, more power to you. Probably live 10 times longer than a meat eater. And um, just make sure that you take carnitine if you test that you need it, and make sure that you take uh, B12. So now let me show you how this plays out on a lab. And then I want to show you the urea cycle. Okay, so for magnesium, we just do this lab test and they measure magnesium levels. And then here this patient is, you know, low. So this person needs more magnesium for their energy production to work. So they're, they're going to struggle with burning fat simply because their magnesium is low. And that's going to be a problem, right? And then maybe the other nutrient that was so important for the mitochondria was CoQ10. And we measure that as well. So here's your CoQ10, and in this particular patient, the CoQ10 levels were fine, right, in the green zone. So this person needs magnesium, and they don't need CoQ10. CoQ10 is really expensive. If you don't need to take it, you probably shouldn't take it. It's kind of a waste of money. I mean, a really good quality CoQ10 could cost you 100 bucks a month. So it, it ends up being cheaper in the long run. If you're just, like, going out and taking CoQ10 and you don't need it, Within the first three or four months of spending all that money on a really good CoQ10, you could have just bought the lab kit, okay? So for sure, for sure, for sure, I see 100% of the time, it's more efficient to drop the money on the labs and figure out what you really need than to just randomly take things that you think you might need. Okay, so magnesium and CoQ10, those are important. And then we mentioned earlier this carnitine shuttle thing, right? Remember, that's the peroxisomes, that's like the backup generator. And here, Look at this, you guys, you can measure this. Like, this is phenomenal. You just gotta appreciate Richard Lord. Like, he just sat down and thought one day, why don't we just start measuring these things, you know? And then he's like, Andy Browley was like, well, yeah, I have a lab, you wanna work for me? And Richard's like, yeah, I'll work for you. Let's measure things. And now we have this field of functional medicine. Look, adipate, there it is, suberate, and ethylmalinate. These are the three ways that we can see if carnitine is working or not. And remember, carnitine is a shuttle. Carnitine pulls the fat molecule over to your mitochondria. If you don't have enough carnitine, adipate and suberate go up, and ethylmalinate goes up. And we'll look at this patient, high suberate. That means they're not able to burn fat. You could eat really well. You could have an exercise program that is the envy of the world. And if you don't have enough carnitine and your suberate goes up, your liver is not going to be able to do the thing that it wants to do, okay? So this is a classic nutrient deficiency. And there are many, as you might suspect, genetic enzyme defects that lead to problems with carnitine. Some people are just born with really crappy genes when it comes to carnitine. I don't know. Some people are born six feet tall. Some people are born and they're five feet tall. Some people have blue eyes, some people have green eyes. You know, some people are born and, you know, they can drive cars really fast. And some people are born and they can play ping pong really well. There's lots of different things that happen with genetic variation in human beings. Some people are born with really poor carnitine enzymes. It's a genetic problem. And these markers go up. You see it on the test. And bummer, you know, that's just the way it is. That person needs a lot more carnitine than the average person would in order to burn fat. And that's sort of the typical person where, you know, this happens to me all the time in my practice where I'll, I'll be working with a married couple and um, let's say the, you know, the woman decides she's going to go on a diet to lose 10 or 15 pounds. And she's like, okay, my husband's going to do it too. You know, the whole household is going to be behind this. And then the husband drops 20 pounds in 20 days and, the, and you know, the wife has lost like two pounds and she's just you know, so frustrated. And so, you know, and we do the testing and you see, oh gosh, you know, 
you're, you have a genetic defect with your carnitine enzymes. So your ability to burn fat, even on this perfect diet, isn't so great. Your husband happens to not have that genetic defect. So he's burning fat like a crazy person uh, because those enzymes are, are working well. And again, this is like the, the fate of our genetics. So you can measure the mitochondria, the magnesium, the, uh, the CoQ10. You can measure uh, these actual um, carnitine markers. And then let's go back just for a second. I'm going to show you one other thing that's kind of cool. And Anne Louise Gittleman talks a lot about this in her book or books, which is the different kinds of fatty acids. And they're very interesting, and they're worthy of our study. Uh, because these fats are constituting every cell membrane in your body is made from these fats. Every uh, large swaths of your brain are, you know, made from fat. You know, your brain cells are all insulated with fat. Um, so these fats on a good day can be very positive and very healthy for us, whereas obviously the buildup of fat over time is not so great. So I'll show you here a little bit about these are omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids. And um, these fats are the sort of constituents or the building blocks for all our steroid hormones. These fats have very powerful anti-inflammatory and pro-inflammatory effects. These fats um, have a major, major regulatory control you know, over the brain in terms of mood problems like depression and anxiety are often related to problems with these fats. Uh, energy and chronic fatigue is often related to this. Hormone, female hormone or male hormone imbalances, low sex drive often relate to these fats. Immune system problems often relate to these fats. They're really important. Some of these fats make these things that are called prostaglandins you may have heard of. Arachidonic is one of the famous ones. Uh, we make these things called leukotrienes. So we're regulating immune system functioning, um, inflammatory functions, all kinds of things with these fats. And I, you can kind of see where this is going. Oh, here's like, you know, what are the things that are important? You know, from everything from your eyes to your heart to your joints uh, to, you know, your immune response. All these are, you know, critical uh, functions that are impacted by fat, omega-3 and omega-6, brain development, et cetera, et cetera. So I'll show you one more diagram here because these are pretty important. These are the fats that we're talking about. So you can see on the left-hand side, omega-3. On the right-hand side, omega-6. You need both. A, you need a balance of the threes and the sixes. Omega-3s, the most famous, are flaxseed oil and the fish oils. Omega-6, not as famous, uh, evening primrose oil. GLA, sometimes we uh, use it in the form of borage or borage oil, okay? And it's common, uh, I don't know, what do you call it? Like common, not common knowledge, but sort of a common rumor that omega-6 are bad and omega-3 is good. It really all depends on the lab, okay? And so I'll just show you some examples of that. So obviously you need to have fat for this whole thing to work. Now, here's an example of omega-3 and omega-6 fats in someone, and they're both normal. Okay, you can see up on the top part of the lab test, they're measuring the different omega-3s, just so you become familiar with these. ALA is the first one, that's from flax. EPA is the second one here. This one here is very famous, DHA. Those are the fish oils. Linoleic, GLA is number six here. Here's our arachidonic. I'm circling the kind of famous ones. And so you get these from your food. And again, um, you can also then start to produce these fats based on these pathways I just showed. So you can see you start off, for example, here with the ALA. You take that delta-6 desaturase enzyme, and then you make this fat. And then you tell the delta-6 elongase enzyme and then you make this fat and then you take the delta 5 enzyme and then you make this fat right so your body's kind of chung, 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 going down and making one fat from one to the next and if you see some examples here like with ALA it says here delta 6 desaturase 
inhibited by age. <laughs> That's uh, is that the age of the fat or the age of the patient? I don't know. I'm just joking. But anyways, and inhibited by alcohol. Oh, that's a bummer. So if you have a bunch of alcohol, that delta six desaturase enzyme just got knocked out of the picture. Oops. So what's going to happen? You're not going to be able to process these fats very well. So what do you think that means? If you drink alcohol, you can screw up these enzymes that burn fat and convert fat for two or three days easily. One glass of wine, forget about the calories. Just say it has no calories. It does have calories, obviously, but that's not the problem. One glass of wine can screw up your liver's ability to burn fat for days because it messes with these enzymes. What a bummer. So if you're on this really low calorie diet and you're like eating 1200 calories a day and you're like, oh, I'm gonna have that glass of wine and it totally is okay because I'm still gonna lose weight. No, you won't. It's not all these calories are the same. The alcohol and the wine is gonna nuke this enzyme and then you're gonna mess up your fat burning for a couple of days. So this is also where the genetic defects lay, right? You could have an, a genetic defect with the Delta-6 enzyme or the Delta-5 enzyme, and then you're not gonna process these fats very well. You're not gonna burn fat very efficiently and um, you're gonna get frustrated. And again, you can see this on the lab test. Um, imagine that there's a block because an enzyme is broken, right? That would mean that the one fat doesn't convert to the next fat. So these are often genetic issues. Remember we talked about genetic problems with carnitine. Well, you can have genetic problems with fatty acids, which explains a lot of weight gain in a lot of different patients. Let me show you some examples. Uh, let's see here. Oh, well, there's a convenient example. I just actually randomly picked this one up, but we see this a lot, so I'm not too surprised. So. This particular patient has plenty of EPA. That's the fish oil right there, EPA. EPA levels are great. Oh, well then why isn't this next fat okay? Should be just chunking down one to the next. The enzyme right here is messed up. Could be alcohol, right? Could be genetics. Could be some combination of the two. Remember, one glass of wine is going to screw up your fat burning for a couple of days. One, one enzyme defect is going to screw up your fat burning for your whole life. And this explains why some people come in and they say, I don't know. I'm eating, you know, 1,000 calories a day. I keep gaining weight. It doesn't make any sense. Don't know what to do. Here's another example of a damaged enzyme, enzyme system. You see the linoleic and the GLA are okay. They're in the green zone. So you should have... All these other ones below it, okay, but they're not. And you can see there's an enzyme defect right there, okay? Is it environmental? Could be a toxin. Is it genetic? Could be a gene. We're not sure, just looking at the lab. But you can see where in the process of, of you know, converting these fats the problem is. Okay. And, of course, if you can't convert these fats well, you're going to end up without the ability to burn fat well, okay? So you need these fats in order to burn fat. So again, you can see the enzyme defect really clearly in this case. There's one right there. Could be nutrient-based or genetic. There's one right here. And when you wanna look at the sciencey part of this, you go back to these diagrams here, and you can see how this all plays out. In fact, I have one student in my class, um, student becomes a teacher kind of thing, uh, Sam Shea, amazing doctor. He's got these enzyme pathways like, woo, Sam, man, dude, you are so cool. So he took uh, all these charts and he's like mapped out every enzyme and every pathway, just amazing. He's like super smart doctor. So here again, you can see if this enzyme's messed up, you're not gonna convert this one fat to the next. And you can, if you sit down for long enough with these charts and with your lab, you can figure out exactly where your enzyme defects are. Sometimes it's a nutrient that's making the enzyme not work, and sometimes a genetic factor. Sometimes it's a toxin. There's a lot of different things that can cause it. Point being that, you know, bad genes and environmental toxins can easily create a fat burning problem. All right, so let's go back here. So just a little retake, rehashing of what we've talked about. We've got this idea that we're looking at the liver, Anne Louise Gittleman's book tells you how to eat for your liver. Just follow everything in there to the, to the bite. We've got a source of fat coming from the small intestine. That's what you're eating. And then we've got the fat that your body's making inside the liver itself. And that's what they're trying to show here. So your body's making cholesterol here 
and then pinching off these little thingies here to make fat, right? These are the lipoproteins that are shooting out into your bloodstream. So you make fat all from scratch, right? It's like cooking a homemade dinner, right? You're making it from scratch. And you can and do make a lot of fat from glucose, from sugar. You can see glucose, glycolysis, you get acetate, then it goes into here and your body starts to turn that into fat. So you, it's not just the dietary fat that you're making fat from, okay? it's also from carbohydrate. That's why you can be on a really low fat diet and still be really fat because the carbohydrate, if you're too high in the carbohydrate, you're gonna make body fat um, even though you're not eating a lot of it. Okay? And then in a perfect world, the fats that you eat and the carbs that you eat get converted and sent over here to the mitochondria where you burn them up for fuel. And you have tons of energy. You don't know what to do with yourself because you're making all this energy from all your fat and you're skinny and energetic when that system is working well. And let's take another peek at, remember, to a quick refresh for the mitochondria uh, themselves, we're concerned about magnesium levels, and CoQ10 levels. So let's look at this other lab here. This person is good with their CoQ10, the levels are normal. And then we're like, uh-oh, this is not great. You can see potassium, magnesium, and calcium are all low. So you need that magnesium to burn the fat to get the energy from the mitochondria, right? So this person would need, like the other patient, some magnesium but not CoQ10. And let's see, oh, this is the same one we just saw a minute ago. So let's look at one, well, one more area. We've got another few minutes, and I want to talk about detox pathways. So there's, if we're talking in a very simplistic way, two super, super important detox pathways that you just need to memorize and know. Okay, one is going to be the glutathione-related functions here. And these markers here are all tests for glutathione. Alpha-hydroxybutyrate, pyroglutamate, and sulfate. These are all markers that look at glutathione, okay? And glutathione is the ultimate antioxidant that, that's protecting your liver from all the bad stuff out there. But there's another pathway that's super important too. And this other pathway that is super important is, um, you know, not as well known, not as often talked about. And you can see it on these tests in a couple of different ways. So your doctor may or may not know about this one. It's just not as well studied in functional medicine. See this little orotate marker here? That's a marker for ammonia detoxification, how your body clears ammonia. And if your body can't clear ammonia, then the ammonia builds up and impacts your brain. And you can imagine just the sound of ammonia in your brain, it doesn't sound like a healthy thing, does it? And by and large, it, you know, people don't feel very good when they have a lot of ammonia in their brain. And let me just show you real quick here. Uh, that's on page 197. Let me find it. Sorry, I'll go back this way. So it's called the urea cycle. And the urea cycle is how we clear out ammonia from the body. And you can very carefully measure this. Sorry, I'm not skipping forward in the best way here probably, but I'm trying to find 197. Oh, I see at the bottom there, I can see it. Hang on a sec. We're almost there. Oh, there's your glutathione. Remember, that's really important, but we're not gonna talk about that now. We're gonna talk about, oh yeah, let's just talk about it for a second because we just kind of cruise by it. So here's your glutathione, the ultimate antioxidant that's gonna protect your liver. And there's three things that you use to make glutathione. One's called um, glycine, okay. One's called glutamate and one is called cysteine. And so if your glutathione levels are low, you can take glycine, you can take cysteine or N-acetylcysteine and your glutathione will shoot right up and that will protect your liver from oxidative stress. That's a little better known, you may have heard of that. What I wanted to talk more about today was uh, the urea cycle because you just don't hear that much about it. So if either glutathione levels are off or the urea cycle is off, you're going to have a problem with environmental toxins building up, right? In one case, ammonia. In another case, it could be many other things if glutathione levels are off, anything from mercury to lead to toluene to benzene. And as those levels start to build up, you know, they're going to impact the brain, 
cardiovascular system and whatnot. And then things go bad from there. So here's the urea cycle. And you can see it's a cycle. You can see this little circle here, right? And it uses these amino acids called citrulline, ornithine, arginine, amongst others. And here's your ammonia. So your body struggles to run this pathway using these amino acids, citrulline, ornithine, arginine, in order to clear ammonia. And if you can't clear the ammonia and the ammonia builds up, then you're gonna have that ammonia in your brain and you're gonna have a problem. You can have ammonia build up from excessive protein in your diet. You can have the ammonia build up from bacterial overgrowth in your gut. It's a bunch of different ways you can get that. And I just want to show you on the test again, because this isn't talked about a lot. A lot of times people talk about phase one and phase two, but the marker for ammonia buildup right here is orotate. If orotate is high, you have an ammonia buildup problem. Yeah, something to just keep in the back of your mind. And then similarly, I'm going to show you this one other thing before we wrap up here. And you know, I was talking to somebody the other day, and I guess, you know, I've always been interested by these labs, and I feel like there's not a lot of people teaching the labs, certainly not directly to the public. And this is like basic physiology you should just know. Okay, here we go. So see, look how cool this is. We're looking at the amino acids now on the test. Here's the sulfur amino acids that are glutathione related, methionine and taurine. Now, if these are low, then you would have a problem with the detox uh, system in regards to a problem with methionine, I mean, in regards to glutathione. And then here's your urea cycle. Remember, we just looked at arginine, citrulline, ornithine. If these are low, okay, if these are low, then that shows a very clear problem with clearing ammonia. And that makes people feel tired, memory problems are created, brain fog, you know, it just feels like you're living in a chemical haze. When these markers are high, you can see these are high here, that shows that the urea cycle is being used quite actively, and it also indicates some B vitamin deficiency related problems, right? So if we go back here and start to think about all these things, maybe do a quick little wrap up for you all. And here. So um, I didn't talk too much about this. I've talked about this in other lectures quite a bit, um, but there's also phase one and phase two liver detoxification. Phase one is run by a lot of nutrients, uh, B vitamins and antioxidants. Phase two is run by these sulfur containing compounds that we just looked at, uh, glycine, methionine, and acetylcysteine. So you need those nutrients to run phase one and phase two. You need the urea cycle nutrients to run the urea cycle. And how do you know where the problem is? Well, you simply do the lab and you see what part of, you know, why is your liver collapsing? Why are you not breaking down environmental toxins? And what's really the problem there? Okay, so there's detox markers all over here. And once you learn how to interpret these, you know, quite accurately, you'll be in good shape uh, if you find a doctor that can do that. And then why does this matter in terms of weight loss? Well, you're going to have, in addition to the liver, you know, explanation that we talked about already, you're also going to have a problem with burning energy if you have a lot of free radical damage because of toxin buildup, right? And that causes what we call oxidative stress or oxidation. And that oxidation is going to damage the mitochondria, which are the very structures you're trying to burn fat with. So we talked earlier a lot about the nutrients, individual nutrients that are involved in transporting the fat or the magnesium and the CoQ10, you need to burn the fat. But what if there's a lot of oxidative stress and the mitochondria themselves are actually damaged? Then you're completely unable to even think about burning fat, right? Because the actual structures are gone. The structures that do that are gone. So you can have nutrient deficits that lead to this problem. You can have alcohol consumption or toxin exposure that leads to this problem with the liver burning fat. You can have oxidative stress from toxins that not only is going to block fat burning, but can actually damage the very structures that are supposed to burn fat. So we have to be very aware and careful about oxidative stress and um, all of our exposures to environmental toxins and whatnot. Okay, so I'm going to wrap it up for today. And we'll end on a quick little review here. And just look at the lab one more time so you can see all the different things that you can measure. I mean, I don't I don't just wish that I knew about this when I was a patient, because in my early 20s I became a 
a functional medicine patient. I wish I had learned this stuff, you know, my first five years of being a doctor, let alone being a patient. So anyways, um, we're going to, we can then measure essential amino acids, if we just we're looking at. Um, we talked about uh, some of them are for detox, some are for your heart, some are for your brain, right? So we can measure um, amino acids. We can measure these minerals like uh, magnesium that we talked quite a bit about today. It's important. We can measure these antioxidants like CoQ10 that you need for producing energy. It's another good example. Of, that's a fat-soluble antioxidant. Uh, let's see. And I'm skipping just to the parts of the test that we've did. You can measure specifically all your omega-3 and omega-6 fats. See what the status is of your fat, healthy fats in the body. I remember to a certain extent this is controlled by diet. To a large extent it's controlled by your genes. And there's pages of fats. You can also measure saturated fats and unsaturated fats. And there's the fats going on, on there. And then you can measure the mechanisms that make all this happen, right? The fat burning or fat metabolism, carnitine. You can measure the energy production itself, and whether you need the CoQ10 or magnesium. And then we didn't talk a whole lot about this, but you can also measure the B vitamins. And then you can measure the detoxification pathways, both ammonia related and phase one, phase two, liver detox related or glutathione related. All that can be laid out on these tests. All right, so I'm going to wrap it up for tonight. I hope you guys have a great rest of your week. And if you're interested in picking up a copy of that book, go for it. And I think it's a wonderful program if you want to try to get your liver in better shape. Strongly endorse you all doing that. Okay, take care. We'll catch you next time. Bye for now.